All right. So um, I think my screen should be sharing right now. Um, if you're not able to see it, please uh, let me know. But it looks like the screen is, is being shared right now. All right. So we're going to get started. Um, my name is Israel Eko, and I'm a Cloud Solutions Architect with Microsoft uh, One Commercial Partner. That's what it used to be called before, but now it's called Microsoft Global Partner Solutions. So if you've heard any of those names before, um, that's where I work and that's what I, I do for Microsoft. So as part of the Global Partner Solutions team, our objective is to help ISV partners and to help service partners to build solutions that run on Microsoft Azure. And within that organization, I am part of the apps and data team and our objective is to help uh, customers and partners to use um, a lot of open source projects to build their solutions. So that is what is driving me to give this talk because I have worked with several customers and partners that are either running these open source solutions on Azure or they are considering running it. And sometimes they have a lot of questions about how to deploy the solutions and about how to integrate the solutions uh, with the Azure ecosystem. So that prompted me to have this talk so that if you're one of those people that are currently on Azure or considering coming to Azure, then you know some of those questions will be answered. All right, so let's get started. So for the objective today, we're gonna to be covering some of the motivations for events in processing. And then we're gonna talk about what it is and then some of the differences between uh, batch processing and uh, streaming workloads. We're gonna talk about why people are heading towards the open source uh, platforms. And then some of the projects uh, from the open source uh, community, uh, specifically the Apache Software Foundation that are available for you to do ESP on Microsoft Azure. And then for each of these projects, we will cover some of the deployment strategies for deploying them on Azure and then we'll talk about how these projects integrate uh, with the Azure ecosystem. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the upcoming integrations that are not yet uh, present or integrated yet with these open source upstream projects, but we are currently working on uh, closing those gaps. And then we'll have um, next steps and follow up where I will have a link for you to take a look at some of the resources that are available. And then if you have any feedback, you can use that form and you can uh, share it with me and the team will follow up with you as soon as possible. So what are some of the motivations for doing events and processing, uh, particularly on Microsoft Azure? Well, we're working with a lot of retail customers uh, that are managing inventory. So to do this, they are looking for ways of managing their inventory in near real time so that their customer experience would be you know, very good compared to the, the typical workloads, uh, batch workloads that, that they used to do before. We also have customers that are now expecting uh, real-time rewards and real-time um, deal management and things like that. So the, 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 the motivation to do event stream processing is not really something that uh, the, the, the companies and organizations or the product creators or service creators are trying to do. This is something that is driven by expectations from the customer base and that is forcing them to change the architecture to support these new expectations that customers are expecting. We also have financial service customers, healthcare customers, manufacturing and IoT customers that are switching from batch workloads to event same processing. So this is what is causing all these uh, changes in both the uh, proprietary and the open source ecosystem. But today's talk, we're focusing on, on open source. So. These are some of the components of event stream processing. So you typically would have a producer or the origin of the events generating this event and sending it to some kind of temporary buffering or storing mechanism. And then you have some system that is performing computation on these events, pulling them out of the buffer in near real time or retroactively to compute them. And then we have another this, uh, 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 um, the, the endpoint or some other process that is pulling these events off when they have been processed to consume them or to put them in some kind of destination or type it out into another workload or ecosystem that will continue uh, the journey. So these are just some of the components. So this is important because as I'm working through some of these open source projects, some of them have the ability 
to provide all these capabilities. And for some of them, they only focus on the processing part of it. And you will have to have some other system to do the temporary buffering uh, for you to uh, stage the events there before you start to process them. So now we're going to get into what are some of the differences between the batch workloads and the events and processing workloads. Well, this has to do with the data set or the data stream. So if you're working with a fixed bounded set of data where you have a clear list of records or a clear list of events that you have to process or compute, then this is uh, you know a batch workloads. With batch workloads, when we've started the processing, whether, whether we're doing enrichment, whether we're filtering or whatever we're doing, we're working with a, a fixed set of records or a fixed set of events or messages to process. So this is bounded and it's not open-ended like we will see in events and processing where we're not dealing with a specific beginning or a specific end of events. We're dealing with a continuous stream of events. And sometimes we may have to do something like Windows operations to uh, specify a particular window that we have to analyze or process. So the key difference between the batch workloads and the event stream processing workloads is that with the batch workloads, we're dealing with a fixed set of records. However, with the event stream processing workloads, we're dealing with an unbounded situation where we're continu uh, um, continuously working with these messages or these events as they arrive into the system uh, from the producers. Now, I'm going to move on to why um, some of the customers, the current customers and the prospective customers or partners are considering these open source projects. Number one is very flexible. So because the, the, the standard is open, it allows you to go ahead and understand how the internal architecture works and how the component works. And this allows for lower cost because once you understand how it works, it is easy for us to integrate. And like I said before, we have these open standards where it is not like a black box where you don't really understand what is going on. But because you understand what is happening inside, some of these partners are able to uh, create their own integrations based on that understanding and it also allows them to contribute it back so that everybody understands how it works and the project continues uh, to grow and because of this open uh, uh, open um, process it allows for additional integration that may not be possible if something was proprietary so some of the tools that we have today on microsoft azure that you can deploy and you can also integrate with azure for events reprocessing is Apache Kafka. So that's the first one that I see a lot of customers are moving towards. So we have Apache Kafka on, 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 on Azure today, and you can use it for your event-driven architecture. We also see, see customers using Apache Flink, and this is another uh, system that is possible today from the Apache Foundation that customers are using and partners are using to build their own solutions uh, to, to run on Microsoft Azure. Then we have Beam, we have Apache Spark, we have Storm, and, and then we have uh, Apache Pulsar. So this is the, the the project that I'm seeing when I'm talking to customers, whether they are coming from on-prem or whether they are um, moving from other cloud providers to Microsoft Azure, they are using these solutions to do their stream processing workloads. And I'm going to cover uh, some of the key differences and similarities between these projects uh, shortly. So like I said before, um, ESP has the following components that allows you to um, push events from the origin of the event into some, some, temp, some temporary buffering mechanism. And then you have this storage or buffering zone where the stream processor is going to pick it up from there and then do the computation and then push it out to some other destination or to some, or to some, to, to some other system. So for the first project, Apache Kafka. Apache Kafka is a project that has two of the components that, 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 that we're dealing with. So producers can produce the event and send it to, to Kafka brokers and the Kafka brokers can buffer these events and uh, keep it temporarily so that the processing part of Kafka, maybe like KSQL DB or Kafka streams, or even your own consumer can now go pick it up from the, from the buffering zone, uh, perform the computation and then put it back into Kafka for forwarding to another destination or to another system. So Kafka is one of the components from, from the Apache Foundation so, um, that, uh, that, that that supports both the temporary buffering mechanism and also it, it, it has ecosystem, e ecosystem components that allows you to perform compute on the events as they arrive either in near real time or retroactively. Then we also have Apache Pulsar. Um, uh, Apache Pulsar. So Pulsar, just like uh, Kafka, has the ability to temporarily buffer these events as they arrive and it also has uh, a, a, a layer that supports you to, to perform the, the, the computation 
and the processing of these events as they arrive. Um, for the next uh, um, uh, project, I'm, project that, that I'm going to cover, they don't really have any built-in mechanism for storage. So in order for them to buffer these events, something like Apache Flink or Apache Beam or Apache um, a Spark and Storm, they need something else like Apache Kafka or maybe uh, 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 some other uh, buffering mechanism that allows them to, to, uh, to uh, that allows the producers to push these events to that buffering zone. And then once it enters the buffering zone, then something like Apache Flink will now pull it out and perform the computation and either put it back into that uh, buffer or storage mechanism or push it out to another ecosystem or another destination for onward processing or if that's the final destination, then we can stop there. So for Apache Flink, um, it is uh, just a, 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 a project that focuses mainly on the streaming uh, um, side of things, the, the, the compute side of things. Um, Apache Flink is also um, selected by several customers because it kind of consolidates the the uh, data stream API with the data set API that supports batch workloads. So with just one project and one uh, framework, you can support both, both your batch workloads, if you have that, as well as your streaming workloads. So customers tend to uh, 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 um, switch to this one if they think that they're going to need a consolidated API for supporting their batch workloads and their streaming workloads. And then similarly, we have Apache Beam. Apache Beam sometimes runs on, you know, on its, uh, uh, by itself, but uh, it, it typically runs uh, using either the, the, the Flink runner or using Spark behind the scenes to perform the streaming workloads. Just like uh, Apache Flink, uh, Apache Beam supports both uh, streaming workloads and batch workloads using, the, using this consolidated API. So um, with uh, Apache Flink and Apache uh, Beam, you have the ability to do your ESP, but just like uh, Flink, Beam does not have a mechanism that is built in internally to support the buffering, but you use it primarily to do the stream processing and to do the compute part of things. And also uh, Apache Spark is also available on, 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 on Azure and we have the ability to use it to do batch, uh, uh, batch workloads and to do some micro batching, which uh, they call streaming. But um, the streaming capabilities in Spark, in Spark, to my perspective, is not really the same as what you have in Kafka Streams, in uh, Apache Beam, or in Apache Flink. But uh, Spark uh, is one of the tools that I also see some customers using it for streaming workloads. And then finally, I have uh, Apache Storm. Just like the other ones, it, it can be used for streaming workloads but it does not have the storage uh, built in. So you have to integrate this with something like Apache Kafka to use it uh, to do your streaming workloads. So now that we have covered all these different uh, projects and we have taken a look at the ones that uh, focus mainly on streaming, the ones that have the built-in mechanism to do the storage and the ones that um, um, support just the streaming part without the built-in storage, let's take a look at some of the mechanisms in which you can deploy these open source projects on Microsoft Azure. So we have two uh, methodologies. Uh, the first method that we recommend typically for production environments is if possible, try to focus on the fully managed option. So like you have on this screen, we have this metaphor where we have uh, um, uh, uh, bakery products where uh, for the, for the pre-made uh, croissant, you can just pick it up and go your way and you have you know exactly what you need you don't need to understand the internals of how to make one or what uh, the proportions of the components you have to put to make it function properly so um just like that we have similar capabilities on microsoft azure where either from from the microsoft engineering team and product team or from a a partner that we are partnering with on azure we are able to provide you with these fully managed options uh, and sometimes we also have self-managed options if you want to do Full control. So the, the choice between this is just a matter of balancing between how much responsibility you want to take on and how much control you want to have. So for folks that typically maybe in the lower environment, they want to have full control, they typically go with the self-managed options. And for, 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 for the, production, for the pr pr production environment, where they want to offload that responsibility to Microsoft Azure, then, then we typically go with the fully managed options for production. So I'm going to briefly cover some of these uh, deployment strategies on Microsoft Azure for each of the projects as we uh, take a look at all of them. For Apache Kafka, we have the fully managed option from Confluent Cloud. So if you are uh, deploying Apache Kafka or Microsoft Azure, 
We are partnering with um, uh, Confluent today to provide you a Confluent cloud that is fully integrated with Microsoft Azure, where you don't have to separate your deployment resources uh, in a separate portal. Also, the billing is consolidated uh, with, with, uh, with your Azure subscription. So uh, in the past, we used to have it as a separate portal where the deployment and the billing was separate, but now everything is fully integrated with Azure. Um, also, uh, if you're doing primarily the producer and uh, a consumer paradigm, where you don't need something like log compaction, or you don't need, uh, need a, a schema registry or KSQL DB or any of those capabilities, then you can go with the Azure Event Hubs for uh, Apache Kafka. So the Azure Event Hubs for Apache Kafka uh, is using Event Hubs behind the scene, but Event Hubs provides the Kafka protocol in front and allows you to communicate with uh, Event Hubs using the Kafka protocol as if you were talking to brokers behind the scene. Then we have a semi-managed option that is sort of self-managed in some aspect and also uh, managed by Azure in, 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 in some aspects. So if, you're, if you want to deploy your Apache Kafka on Azure, we also have the Azure HD Inside offering where you can deploy your Kafka cluster with Zookeeper, with brokers, um, and you can uh, bring in anything you want to uh, uh, um, deploy in the cluster. So these are some of the options that we have today that supports uh, events reporting on Azure with Apache Kafka in a fully managed or semi-managed um, offering. Then moving on to the environment where you have full control. So if you want to have full control of your Apache Kafka environment, um, what we recommend today is the Confluent uh, platform either on uh, virtual machines or virtual machine scale sets, or you can deploy it um, on Azure Kubernetes service using the Confluent operator. So the second option is what people are typically going with because the Confluent operator has built-in mechanisms to restart the brokers, you know, if something is wrong, to restart Zookeeper, to restart any of the uh, component ecosystems like the schema registry or, or um, um, Kafka streams or any of those things. So if you're running um, a, 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 an Azure Kubernetes environment and you need to deploy your Kafka inside the same environment or inside an isolated environment in your Kubernetes cluster, then we recommend you using the Confluent operator because that is sort of going on autopilot and you don't really have to have uh, too much expertise to understand how uh, Kafka works behind the scenes, to know how to rebalance, to know how to restart, to do all those things. So with the Confluent operator on Azure Kubernetes service, uh, that can be used in production as well. But typically the self-managed option is something that people reserve for lower environments or for maybe POCs and things like that. But when they want, when they want to go to production, they typically go with the fully managed options where they don't have to worry about any of the responsibilities of maintaining uh, the environment. So we have covered Apache Kafka. I'm going to move on now to uh, Apache Spark. So Apache Spark has a fully managed option that's available on Azure today, where you can use the Azure Databricks uh, platform to run your Spark uh, environment. And you can also um, run your Apache Spark environment on um, the Azure HD Inside offering. So that is semi-managed as well, just like how we had uh, for Apache Kafka. And if you are, um, if you are um, so, someone, someone that, that likes to have full control or you, or, or you are doing a POC and you like to test things out, then you can use um, the Azure Kubernetes service and use the native built-in scheduler for Apache Spark on Kubernetes. And you can run your workloads that way using any of the deployment modes that are, that are possible. So now for Apache Storm, just like uh, Kafka, just like uh, Spark, we have a, a fully managed offering that's available through Azure HD Inside. So you can use this if this is what you want to do uh, on Azure. And then we also have uh, the ability to deploy some of these components on Kubernetes, and you can use that as well to deploy your, your workloads for Apache Storm. Then we move on to Apache Flink. So uh, Apache Flink has uh, an option today that you can run on Azure Kubernetes service using either virtual machine scale sets or using the native integration for Apache Flink uh, uh, on Kubernetes. We also have uh, partners that, that, that provide third party products like uh, Cloudera Data Platform and the Viverica Platform. So these platforms allow you to deploy your uh, Apache Flink environment on Microsoft Azure using this uh, managed option. So with those two options, you can also use uh, deploy them on virtual machines 
Um, and I think the, the Viverica one ro uh, runs on, on, um, on Kubernetes using some of the built-in components that they have developed. So that's how we can do Apache uh, Flink today. And then Apache Beam sometimes uses Apache uh, Spark or uses Apache Flink behind the scenes. So if you want to run your Beam workloads, you can set it up in our Kubernetes or on virtual machine scale set and then leverage whatever environment you are using for your Flink or for your Spark workloads to do the runners and to compute uh, the jobs that you need to, to do for your Beam workloads. Then we have Apache uh, Pulsar today, where uh, customers that need to do this today, since we don't have a fully managed offering yet, they can do it either on Kubernetes as well or on Azure Virtual mach uh, Machine uh, scale sets. So now we have covered all these dif uh, all these different deployment mechanisms, where we can deploy Kafka, we can deploy Flink, we can deploy Beam, uh, Pulsar, um, Storm, and Spark on Azure. Now let's take a look at some of the integrations that are possible between those open source ecosystem projects and the Azure ecosystem. So for this, uh, for, 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 for the integrations, I'm gonna take a look at Apache Kafka first. So Kafka has this uh, very cool framework um, called Kafka Connect. So for Kafka Connect, if you're familiar with Kafka, Kafka has uh, a concept called producers where producers are responsible for generating the events and for pushing the events into the Kafka broker. And then you have another concept called consumers that allows uh, the, the certain processes to pull events out of the broker and push it into, into other destinations or consume it um, as is. So the Kafka Connect kind of mirrors that, that approach where we have connectors that monitor um, certain data stores or certain workloads and use the, the changes that are coming out of those, those data stores and they generate events as producers and push them into the Kafka brokers. Then we also have another component called uh, sync connectors that kind of uh, serve as consumers that pull those events out of Apache Kafka and put it into uh, other destinations. So with the Kafka Connect ecosystem, you don't have to worry about all the complexities of doing this and running it and scaling it and doing all those things. So with Kafka Connect, you can use this pull events out of uh, the data source, push it into the Kafka brokers and then push it into the destination. So I, I felt that was necessary because when I'm covering some of these uh, integration opportunities, I'm gonna be talking about you know source connectors and sync connectors. So I want you to understand what I'm referring to as I'm talking about them. So now um, for source connectors, so we have the Azure DB, um, the, the, the Azure Cosmos DB connector that can watch the changes that are happening at Azure Cosmos DB. And then you can use this to stream all those changes into your Kafka broker. Um, we also have the Divisium connector that allows you to monitor uh, CDC changes that are happening in Azure Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, and SQL Server. You can stream all the CDC changes, the inserts of offsets, um, uh, the insert of updates and deletes, and then you push those into Kafka as well for onward enrichment or filtering or whatever you want to do. And then you can push it out into a different destination or back into Kafka, uh, depending on what you want to do. Similarly, we also have, uh, you know, uh, service bus, event hubs, IoT hubs, and blob storage connectors that you, ha you, 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 you can monitor and capture all the changes that are happening at this source connectors uh, or source data stores and pull it into your Kafka broker for onward enrichment or integration with other data uh, uh, points and then pushing it out into other environments. Now, once we have uh, pushed the data into Apache Kafka brokers, now we have the ability to now perform any kind of enrichment we want to do or processing. And once that is done, we can push this out into uh, this destination. So uh, we also have Cosmos DB as well. There's a, there's a sync connector for that. We have um, Azure Cognitive Search Connector, Elasticsearch, IoT Hub, Azure Data Lake Store, Gen2, Azure Functions, and Azure Synapse, uh, the, the Synapse Analytics Connector. So it, once, one, once it, the data has arrived in Kafka, if this is one of your, your, your destinations, you can now go ahead and push the data to these destinations and proceed uh, with your changes. Now, we also have Apache Spark as well. So Spark also have the following yeah. integrations where you can integrate between uh, Apache Spark and all these connectors, and you don't have to worry about you know um, any kind of complexity. So you can bring data from these um, uh, data stores, 
uh, into your Spark workloads, finish your computation, and then push it into uh, into your destination um, using the the, 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 the the connection. Similarly, with with uh, Apache Storm, we have the following connectors: Cosmos DB, uh, the Redis endpoint, Event Hubs, Apache Kafka, and Elasticsearch. All these are possible on Microsoft Azure today. With Flink, we have the following connectors, and we're working on more connectors that I'm going to cover uh, 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 shortly. So um, through the MongoDB, uh, MongoDB and Cassandra uh, um, uh, um, um, endpoints or APIs for Cosmos DB, you can integrate your Flink workloads with Azure Cosmos DB. You can also integrate your Flink workloads with any of the Confluent, um, uh, uh, any of the Kafka deployments that we have, like Confluent uh, uh, and Event Hubs for Apache Kafka on Microsoft Azure. We can also integrate today with Azure Blob Storage. So starting in version 1.14, which is coming up soon, you can integrate with the, the Blob Storage and the Data Lake Store uh, um, connector. So um, for Apache Beam, we have the following uh, setup today where you can use the Cassandra API or the Mongo API for Cosmos DB to integrate with Beam. You can also use the Confluent Cloud offering, the Azure Event Hubs offering, or the HG Inside offering to integrate with Apache Kafka. And Azure Red, uh, Redis is also available for you to integrate with Beam if you want to do that. And then uh, Apache Pulsar, you know, just like Kafka, it has this architecture where there's a source pushing data into Pulsar, and where there's a sync pulling data out of Kafka, um, uh, um, Pulsar into those destinations. So we have the following integrations available where you can, where you can. Uh, deploy your Pulsar workload and integrate with any of these endpoints that are available today on Microsoft Azure. So one thing that is common between all of these workloads is that we can use Azure Active Directory as well. So depending on the environment that you're working with, so if, if you're running on uh, Kubernetes, if you're running on virtual machines or any other environment that integrates with Azure Active Directory, you can use the built-in components for that to uh, integrate with the security um, of the data store that you're trying to integrate with. Another thing is that some of the healthcare, retail, and financial service customers, they like to run their workloads inside virtual networks. So with the virtual network integration, you can use this and keep all, all your data between the producers, the consumers, and the compute layer you know, inside a private network without having to run anything through the internet if you don't have to, uh, to do that. So now that we have covered uh, the integrations, that are currently possible today. I want to briefly go over what, some of the work that we're working on today to integrate with additional open source uh, projects and uh, you know make this a more complete environment for you to do your, uh, your, your, your workloads on. So for Apache Kafka, today we're currently working on implementing the blob storage and the, and the data lake storage and two integration for, for tier storage. So we are, we, are, we, are, we are always trying to add additional integration for Apache Kafka so that any customer that is running these workloads on Azure will be able to integrate with any origin or any destination that they want to integrate with uh, successfully. So tier storage is something that will really improve the performance of your Apache Kafka workloads because it would decouple the, 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 the storage from the compute. So it would allow you to scale your uh, storage needs much more uh, uh, flexibly without having to worry about bundling the compute layer and the storage layer, which is what is happening today. So this is something that we're currently working on, and hopefully in 30.1 or a future version of Kafka um, sometime soon, we'll be able to add this capability. And that's something that we're having you know, in progress. And then for Apache Flink as well, uh, we're, 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 the, the team is con you know, currently working on adding these capabilities where we want to add the blob storage and uh, data lake store support for the streaming file sync, we also want to be able to add the Cosmos DB stream and the Azure Event Hub stream, um, stream connector as well. And then for Apache Beam as well, we want to be able to integrate with our Azure storage solution and also add the Azure Event Hubs and Cosmos DB integration uh, with this um, uh, open source project as well. So if you have any requests that you would like to integrate with or you have a particular workload that is not covered by any of this current uh, work that we're doing, Please feel free to share it in the in the comments or put it in the link that I'm going to put shortly, and we'll get back to you as to you know how soon we can make that happen for you if it's possible. Now to summarize, we have covered how to integrate between the Azure ecosystem and these projects. We also went through some of these projects that are possible 
for you to deploy your like, event processing workloads on Microsoft Azure. I also covered the deployment strategies that allow you to either uh, fully manage what you want to do or um, um, uh, have uh, uh, a safe managed offering where you have full control of the environment. So again, this has to do with how you balance the responsibility you want to take on and the control you want to have. So if you are in production and you want to focus on your core business, you don't want to keep worrying about hiring people or even if, even if you have the talent, uh, diverting those resources into maintaining, the, into maintaining the infrastructure for your business. So if you, if you just want to focus on your business and delivering the core value of what you want to do for your customers, for your service or for your products, then the fully managed option is typically what, what we recommend. And in lower environments, you have the option of fully, uh, you know, you know, self-managing the infrastructure if that's what you want to do as well. So uh, if you're ready to get started, we have a resource that I'm going to share with you. So if you uh, if you take out your your phone and you point to this uh, resource, you should be able to find a link where we have additional documentation on Git on, on, on the GitHub URL for all these different open source projects and also some of the work that we're working on. So if you have any uh, anything that you would like to share as a feedback or as a request, you can make it on that page and we'll get back to you as, as soon as possible. So that was everything I had to cover today. Uh, I'm going to pause here for any questions that you have. And once I, uh, I close the, the, the sharing, I should be able to see any questions you have in the chat and we will take a look at that um, right away. So let me now take a look at what we have in the chat window and see if we have any question. All right, so Patrick is saying, is Apache NiFi available on Azure as self-managed or fully managed? So um, to my knowledge, we don't have a uh, um, fully managed option yet. So I will share this feedback with our engineering team. Um, if you are familiar with how to deploy it, then you can either use uh, you know, Kubernetes or you can use virtual machines or virtual machine scale sets to provision the underlying infrastructure. And once you do that, then you can deploy the dependencies and then deploy the NiFi uh, setup uh, for your environment. But uh, to my knowledge, we don't have a fully managed option yet. Uh, the, the only option would be self, you know, self-managed uh, if you want to do that on uh, on virtual machines or on Kubernetes. So it looks like that was the only question. I have not seen any other question um, again. Okay, so Patrick says, cool, a fully managed version will be nice someday. Yes, yeah, so um, I would bring this feedback, you know, to our product team and to our engineering team. And uh, we, we're constantly adding new capabilities uh, to Azure and also new integrations to Azure based on feedback that customers are, are bringing. So once we reach a particular threshold, then it, you know, it's possible for that to become a priority and for, uh, and for us to uh, add that integration or that capability for you. So if you have any uh, questions or you have any uh, desire to bring your workloads to Azure, please feel free to share that and that feedback will be sent to the engineering product team uh, for priority. So I will continue to wait for about 10, about 10 more minutes. You know, if you have any questions, I'm still gonna be around and you can, you know, you can put the questions in the chat or you can use that that form that's available on, on the page that I'm sharing right now. And we can take a look at the, at the questions and, and get back to you as soon as possible. But yes, we have partnership with our engineering team and our product team. So all this feedback is constantly being shared with them. And um, it goes into the priority based on how often or how frequent it's being requested. So for everyone that was able to join today, I thank you very much for your time and I thank you for your participation. I am very grateful for you stopping by my talk, you know, to take a look. So thank you for that. <laughs>